Are you guys ready? Yes? Not too angry? Let's do it. Let's kill the app store. Let's kill the app store. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's kind of crazy, but yeah. So welcome everybody. Is there anyone who wants to come to see how the app stores will be killed by a lonely guy from Belgium together with a Romanian living in London? No? Okay. So welcome everybody. So I do my best to entertain you just before lunchtime. I used to be a ringmaster in a circus just before going back to mobile. Actually, uh, it's true, it's true. I mean, if you go on LinkedIn, you will see I'm dressed as a ringmaster and also in Etsy. Um, actually, I started, just to give you a bit of background, I started in mobile in the days of black and white logos and monophonic ringtones, if it rings a bell. So it was, uh, it was in the early 2000s. And then I did a few things like producing rock bands and, and a circus, so it's a true story. And uh, 17 months ago, I came back to mobile and I co-founded this company called Etsy.me with Alex, who is here today. So I know that in, uh, so how many people in, in the audience today are developers? So people not like me. Wow, I'm, I'm, I'm like the only dummy in the room. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I, I created actually this, this app that I will present you in the end. Uh, as, a, as a mobile web app for dummies, so not for developers. So sorry for the advanced people who are much smarter than I am in the room, but uh, yeah, I did it for myself, basically. So I'm very excited to be with you today to share my crazy vision about the future of mobile, and I hope that this hashtag will be trending like hell in, at the HTML5 Dev Conference and maybe uh, in the next few months or in the next few years. And what you will hear and see today in the presentation is the result... Uh, of our work as a three-person bootstrap startup from London, in foggy London in, in, mainland, in, in Europe. Uh, I can already tell you that you can access a copy of the presentation, so uh, approximately the same thing, uh, on etsy.me slash html5. This should work on uh, Android, iOS devices, smartphone, tablets, and also on your PC. I uh, get back to Etsy in the end, but if you went to our booth, uh, you already know that it's a mobile web app to create mobile web apps. And it should make you smile. Yeah, you smile. I saw you. You're a developer. No? Okay. So is the <laughs> very smile. Um, so first of all, let me apologize. We are biased, of course. I mean, not only because we are at the HTML5 developer conference, but also because we love HTML5. And to be honest, before I started this project, I only knew the letters HTML5. So two years ago, I didn't know, I didn't know what it was. Uh, I'm not a JavaScript developer, but gradually, um, when I saw what Alex was able to do in HTML5 and JavaScript, I also fell in love with HTML5, and we are deeply in love with this technology. But, but we had also our dark side. We had our native moments, okay? So we... Actually, in the beginning, in December 2012, when we started developing our project, we wanted to uh, use web technologies uh, because basically that's what Alex knew. Uh, but then we wanted to wrap it in, you know, using PhoneGap or something similar and publish it in the app stores. And why? Because it's what everyone does. You know, we were like the sheep following what the other guys are doing. And it's what everyone has been doing actually since 2008 when Apple launched the app store. It was almost six years ago, which now seems like an eternity, I guess. On July the 10th, 2008, Steve Jobs officially opened the App Store, which was an extension, if you remember, of the iTunes distribution model. The App Store started with 500 apps, and today there are more than 1 million apps in the App Store. It's growing each and every day, which is not bad. So it's kind of crazy to say that I believe in a future beyond the App Stores, I guess. Uh, but what about the early days before uh, the App Store? What about the early days of the iPhone? What was the original vision of Steve Jobs? One that wasn't totally possible in uh, 2007 because the devices were not uh, at the right uh, level, because the networks were not there. You didn't, you didn't even have 3G uh, at that time, and also because the browsers uh, didn't actually allow you to make something uh, smooth enough. Let's have a closer look. Let's remember that one last thing. But I do have one last thing that I want to talk about. And that, of course, is the iPhone. The iPhone ships on June 29th. That is just 18 days from today. 
I believe at 6 p.m. in the evening, they will go on sale. <laughs> June 29th, 18 days from today. Now, what about developers? What about developers? We have been trying to come up with a solution to expand the capabilities of iPhone by letting developers write great apps for it and yet keep the iPhone reliable and secure. And we've come up with a very sweet solution. <laughs> and let me tell you about it. So, we've got an innovative new way to create applications for mobile devices. Really innovative. And it's all based on the fact that iPhone has the full Safari inside it. The full Safari engine is inside of iPhone. And it gives us tremendous capability, more than has ever been in a mobile device to this date. And so you can write amazing Web 2.0 and Ajax apps that look exactly and behave exactly like apps on the iPhone. And these apps can integrate perfectly with iPhone services. They can make a call. They can send an email. They can look up a location on Google Maps. After you write them, you have instant distribution. You don't have to worry about distribution. Just put them on your internet server. And they're really easy to update. Just change the code on your own server rather than having to go through this really complex update process. And they're secure with the same kind of security you'd use for transactions with Amazon or a bank. And they run securely on the iPhone so that they don't compromise its reliability or security. And guess what? There's no SDK that you need. You've got everything you need if you know how to write apps using the most modern web standards to write amazing apps for the iPhone today. You can go live on June 29th. Yes, this was not a hoax. It's a real video from 2007. And yes, actually, this is exactly the speech that motivated us to take up the challenge of building an outstanding mobile web app. I hope you will have the chance to try it. Smooth, easy to use, one that could rival with its native counterparts. And we approach this actually as a game. It was a game against ourselves, a game against the status quo, because everything is going in the sense of the App Store at the moment. A game to execute the vision that Steve Jobs, who is not here today, unfortunately, uh, introduced before the App Store, to prove that there is a future beyond the App Store. And uh, I even wrote an article that you can write on Medium, uh, which is called, uh, read on Medium, sorry, which is called, uh, How I Got Inspired by Steve Jobs to Prove Him Wrong or Right, depending on the time. So our vision is that the period we've been living since uh, 2008 is a transition transition to something different, to something that we actually experience every day on our PCs, the freedom of the open web. The open web, where the URL, you might notice uh, those three letters, the URL is the fundamental unit of sharing. And I was shocked three weeks ago, actually, when just in the middle of the Facebook F8 keynote, Ilya Sukar, the CEO of Pars that we are using, by the way, for our app, was sharing nostalgic memories of days gone by. So we listen to Ilya Sukar, the CEO of Pars, and this is not a hoax also. Now I want to talk about something near and dear to my heart, and hopefully near and dear to yours, the URL. I've been working with the URL for as long as I can remember. The URL is just beautiful. It made the web beautiful. The web is still beautiful. And the URL is the fundamental unit of sharing. I remember using the URL and sending it to people on email, on IRC, on ICQ, on AIM, um, on Facebook, certainly, and, and even MySpace. I mean, every communication platform that has existed, still exists, will exist, is going to use the URL. And it's a shame that it's not really a big deal on mobile right now. Yes, and actually each of the apps on Etsy is, guess what, a URL. 
So now let's dive into the subject of our presentation. What's the future for those guys? And I could have added some other app stores, I guess. I just took the iOS app store, Windows, uh, and, and Google Play. But we're coming from, from England, and actually paraphrasing the Sex Pistols, I would say that the future, in my opinion, isn't really bright for the traditional app stores. But of course, when you look at such a graph, you see here, it's going up and up, and it was only in 2012. You might tell me, Fred, that's my name, are you crazy or what? You don't see that it's going up and up and up. It will never end. It's going, you know, through the roof to the sky. But does it mean it will always do? So now we'll play a game together. You see that? This is a big, it's going up. 2004, 2007. Does that, anyone guess what it is? No? Okay. Let's go for the next one. Okay, the next one, the fall. 2007, 2012. And sorry for those of you who have one in the room. Sorry, guys. Yeah, sorry. Eternity doesn't exist even for the most uh, successful companies. And, uh, okay, let, let's take this one, maybe. Nothing is forever. Along with BlackBerry, you've got this one. So in 2006, according to Michael Arrington, it was supposed to be the biggest site on the internet. And in 2011, even the founders of MySpace stopped using the service. You see? Okay, so let's discuss now seven reasons why app stores are doomed. But let's be positive, because I'm not only bashing against the app stores. I could have titled my speech, and I wrote also an article on Medium about it, Welcome to the Post-App Stores Era. But let's start by bringing back some memories of the good old days. So what's funny about evolution is that it repeats itself from platform to platform. Do you remember the early days of connecting a PC to the internet? You remember this sound? Okay. Okay, let's have a look at the very native experience, very pro oh, it's awful, yeah, of the internet pioneers. So the early days of the web. America Online can do all that. Yeah. How about sending your mom some nice flowers? All you do is click on Marketplace, we place an order. Call now for America Online, a new way to use your computer to communicate, have fun, and get instant news and information. Flowers are sent. Now let's access the online travel service. How long have you had this? About a week. And it's so easy. All you do is point and click. But how does it work? All you need is a computer and a regular phone line. They send you the software and give you 10 free hours to check it out. Call now for your free America Online Startup Kit and get free software and 10 free online hours. It's everything you need to get online. Plane tickets are ordered. Now, let's look up dinosaurs. What do you think? Compton's Encyclopedia or National Geographic? You get all that with America Online? Yeah, you can read Business Week Online before it hits the newsstand. Update your stock portfolio every 15 minutes with PC Quote. You can even play fantasy football. Call now for 10 free hours of America Online and get instant access to the worlds of sports, finance, computing, and entertainment. Here come the dinosaurs. I saved you a trip to the library. That's great. Yeah, downloading is easy, too. You know, I can even send email on the internet. And of course, there's my personal favorite, live chat. That's how I met my new kayaking buddies. We'll check that out later, after the game. Okay, so this is the way it worked in the early PC days when AOL... And in Europe, there were some, you know, competitors, other names like Infony in France, for instance, when they were the main window to the Internet. And in the same way as most native apps today, the ones connecting to Internet sources in the cloud, are actually well-crafted, beautiful windows to the Internet. And the funny thing, you know what, is that most of those services can be accessed via web browsers on a desktop computer. So now, let's list the seven reasons why I think that the app stores are doomed and will be overthrown by the open web. This is the first reason why I think those app stores don't have a bright future. The download access flow is just bad. So let's take a very popular native app, Snapchat. Okay, this is the flow from a URL mention in a tweet. So I received a tweet, or I tweeted something about Snapchat, snapchat.com. I go to their mobile website. You see, here it's on my mobile. I should have it downloaded here, but I, I had already downloaded uh, the app, actually. I go to the App Store, so it takes a, takes a while, actually. If I'm lucky, I'm, I'm logged in. If not, I have to put my credentials if I didn't forget my password. 
And then I have to, to wait. It reminds me a bit of this sound we heard about, you know, AOL. You know, the thing like that. Or the old tapes on the, on the spectrum, for instance. I wait for that. And then I can go to Snapchat. There, there's some sign of process, but I, I was kind to them. So it's four steps. Four steps, OK? So now, let's see the web flow. From a URL mention in a tweet, OK, it's a pitch for us in a way, uh, to actually experiencing the, the app in your browser. So it's just one tap, one tap away, instead of four. And when you think about it, what is the actual value of a download? Think about the actual value of a download. Every day on TechCrunch, Mashable, uh, Fold, whatever, you hear about they have, they've had so many downloads in their first week. They were in the ranking, whatever. So what is actually the value of a download? When 25% of the users open an app, just once after downloading it. So the download, they open it, they trash it. And 69% of the users, so that's the actual figures, will open it 10 times or less and then trash it or forget about it. Which means that the vast majority of the users that you will have downloading your app won't become long-time users. Actually, when you think about it, a download is like a door you must open to access the content. But you don't know what's behind the door. It can be even... It can be either heaven or hell. You don't know about it. Yeah, it's true. And in some cases, a download could actually be compared to a visit of a website because there's no other way of, of, of having the experience of a native app than a download. Just think about it. So remember this the next time you will read in TechCrunch those download numbers. Uh, maybe ask them, those guys, for active users or maybe just for registered users. And when you don't like the content, when you don't like the content, after spending so much of your precious time tapping, clicking on links, waiting for a download, you just delete the app, that's easy, and you slam the door and you never come back. This is what happens, simply because the flow has consumed so much of your time. So ask yourself now, how many times have you come back to an app that you violently trashed this way? Not so often. I would like also to mention what I call uh, the international issue. So most of those apps are actually on the cloud somewhere behind the app stores, but sometimes they are only av available in some regional app stores and you have to be a real geek to try to actually find a way to download a US app from Belgium or the UK, for instance. Uh, just think about the, uh, this app, uh, the, the Yahoo uh, news app. That I wanted, I wanted, I saw the keynote of this guy from London. I was in London. I wanted to download this very nice app, by the way, and I had to find some tricks to, to pretend that I was a US citizen, you know? So countless times I bumped into those country warnings, which is such a bad experience. The second reason, updates are just a pain. Updates are just a pain, if you think about it. Updates are a pain both for the app creator and for their users. If you want to adapt your design as an app creator or if you want to change your content, you have to submit the update to the app stores. And if you are lucky enough to be accepted, the users will have to download the update. Okay, so you could tell me that from iOS 7 on on, the, on, um, on, on iPhones and iPods, you've got automatic updates. But, okay, I'm a heavy user. I had 100 different native apps on my iPhone and it just kill my iPhone to have all of those automatic updates running in the background. So I just stopped this. Which means that, as a user, if you don't update the app, you simply run an outdated version, version of, of the app. And, and most users don't even know it. They have the four square of the early days on their, uh, on their iPhone, on their Android device. And iteration based on customer feedback and iteration based also on the market evolution is something that's very important for a, for a developer, for a startup, for any startup. And it's much easier in a web environment to iterate, to change your content as we do for Etsy every day than via the app stores, closed systems. On the web, you simply commit the update and next time your users come back to your app, the content is totally fresh. They don't, don't need to download anything, go to the update section. It's just there, frictionless, frictionless. Third reason, discovery is terrible. Discovery is terrible on the App Store. Searching for interesting apps in an App Store is almost like looking for content in the early days of AOL. And sometimes it's like searching for a needle in a haystack. 
it's true that you've got some discovery apps on the app stores, but they need to make some business. So for obvious commercial reasons, their results are biased very often, and they don't give a comprehensive picture of the ecosystem. So if you are a small indie developer, it's not that easy to surface on, these, uh, on those uh, discovery apps. Moreover, you've got this pain of the incentivized app installs that are impacting the app store charts, which are very important, crucial even, if you want to get a chance to be noticed. And there, is, there was an interesting article, I don't remember the source, but it's also on, in one of my art articles on Medium, which says that there's no real long tail benefit on the App Store. I think it was an article written by someone of Apps Fire. Because the popular apps get the majority of downloads. It's the winner takes it all on the App Store even more than anywhere else. This is what we call the Pareto law, but even more exacerbated in this case, the famous 80%, 20% law. And I told you that the abandonment rate of the apps downloaded via any scheme, but especially via the incentivized schemes, is, is extremely high. So people are just, are just abandoning those, those apps. So they give a totally false picture of the actual cost per install. So it's, it's not that, that beautiful. On the web, if you want to search for something, find something, you simply use Google or another traditional search engine like Bing. And if you apply as a developer, good SEO best practices, your mobile web app can surface as any other website. Usually people ask me, but how can people find you if you're not on the App Store? And I, t I tell them, how did you find eBay before the App Stores? You just tap eBay.com in, in your browser. And uh, magically, you could just visit eBay. Your app will always be one click, one tap away if it's a mobile web app. Reason number four. Reason number four. 30% transaction fees are a steal. That's what we think. As a developer on the open web, you can use many different things. I just gave the example of PayPal and some, uh, some of their percentages, but we could use Stripe, we could use many other uh, solutions. And of course, the fact that you've got 30% cut from the App Store for digital in-app purchases makes a big difference in terms of uh, business model. But you could tell me, it's cool to be on the app stores. You pay for being in the app store. But you see those minions? If you're not a bestseller, you won't get noticed in the crowd, of course. And users won't be able to easily find you. It's not because you're on the app store that people will find you. Order maybe then by typing your name because they read an article on TechCrunch. They type your name in the app store, but they could have typed your name in the browser in the same way. And that would have been one tap away, not five uh, step away, or four or five step away. Fifth reason, native doesn't equal quality. This might sound trivial, but you would expect from an app store that actually with all the hassle that you, 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 you get to get your app on the app store, that actually there would be some quality control. But no, unfortunately, even if in the most curated app store, the iOS one, you come across a lot of really, really bad apps really, with an awful user in interface, an awful user experience, which doesn't even justify all the pain you need to validate, submit your app, update your app. At least on the open web, if you land on a bad web app, you can leave it straight away. This is called the bouncing effect. No hard feelings. There is no quality promise from any middleman. Google doesn't promise that you will find good stuff on Google. It's up to you to find good stuff on Google. So no one to blame if the experience sucks. Whereas on the app stores, even on Google Play, sorry Google, you need to log in, download, open, see the crap, and trash it. And if you're disappointed, as I said before, you never come back to the crap. Because it, it has exercised such a bad power on your mind because of all the time that you spend to experience the crap. Sixth reason, most native apps need the internet anyway. People tell me, but I need to be connected to access your mobile web app. But how can you access YouTube native app without the internet? How can you access SoundCloud without the internet? How can you even search for a house on Airbnb without the internet? It's just impossible. If you offer an app which is plugged to real-time data, or an app displaying a live feed of some dynamic, rich content, whatever, you need the internet because your data is in the cloud. This might sound trivial also, but think about it. So why not simply develop a mobile web app 
that is seamlessly connected to the internet. You know, like Airbnb on your desktop computer, like Airbnb.com, and you see the houses. Magic, you see? This can be the same on mobile. Of course, you could argue that this doesn't apply to those apps, you know, like Angry Birds, Candy Crush, single-player apps that are so popular on the app stores. It's true, kind of. And at the moment, let's admit that uh, the most challenging thing to execute properly in the mobile browser at a UX level which matches the native apps is, uh, is games, especially if you want to play in a totally non-connected environment like between two stations in the Tube in London. And that's maybe why Candy Crush is popular with people in the Tube in London. Maybe. You never know. But it's also evolving. We can talk about it with Alex maybe later. And we would just need more local storage, caching possibilities to free those offline games from the app stores. There's no reason why they should uh, stick to the app store. The last one, finally, let me ask you this question, almost existential question. And I know that maybe in the room there are some people from PhoneGap or whatever. Why would you wrap your web app in a native shell? Why would you do this, okay? Nowadays, a lot of developers actually make HTML5 apps. That's the reason why they are here, basically. And they are shipped to the app stores via different wrapping methods. So they are actually in a kind of small window that wraps them to the app store and connects them to some functions in the device. Why would you do this? Techies will argue that you need a wrapper to access some functions in the device. Yeah, it's partly true, but browsers are evolving, have evolved, and are evolving. Did you know, for instance, that since September 2012 on iOS, that's just before we started, by the way, and earlier even on Android, it's been possible to access your device camera, which is very important uh, for any kind of modern apps, to shoot pictures or use photos from your gallery. But sometimes there, there is just something that you can't really do at the moment on most mobile browsers. It, apparently, it's possible on Firefox OS, but it's notifications, those notifications that keep popping up on your screen. But it's coming. I mean, if you have a look at the recommendations of the W3C. And in the meantime, you can always send the essential messages via what? Guess what? Transactional email, Mandrill, or this kind of thing. And those messages will pop up natively uh, through Gmail, for instance. So you can even access people through notifications via email. You could also argue that you bet on the supermarket Walmart, Walmart effect of the App Store. Okay? So it's like when you want to distribute a product in, uh, in Walmart. But did you know that half of the revenue, half of the revenue in the iOS App Store goes to 25 developers? It's almost like the oligarchs in Russia or in Ukraine, you know? So I would say market yourself on the open web. Use SEO and other growth hacking methods. We can share them afterwards if you want to get noticed. And you will have, according to, uh, to us, better odds to find your target audience. Okay, you could also say that a wrapper offers you the super neat full screen experience on steroids compared with opening the app inside an old school browser. That's kind of correct. But if you want to interact with other web properties, other websites outside the app, and it happens a lot uh, when you think about it, if there are some links in your app, you can either use the transitional solution proposed by Facebook three weeks ago, which is kind of bizarre if you think about it, the app links. Or you can use a mobile web app. And actually, you can switch from one tab to the other. It's very interesting, for instance, if you've got a PayPal link and you just go through the payment process and then you link back to the original app in the browser from one tab to the other. You can play between the tabs. Moreover, here again, browsers are evolving. I mean, the browser that Steve Jobs had at his disposal in 2007 is by no means the browser of today. And here you see the evolution uh, between iOS 6 and iOS 7. There is less and less Chrome around the experience. And I would say that an, an invisible browser would instantly solve the problem. So let, let's say it you know, very slowly so that everyone gets the concept of the invisible browser. So I believe that in the foreseeable future, the browser might be embedded in the operating system. 
enabling you to use mobile web apps without the need to open a browser. At the moment you go on your iOS device or Android, you open Chrome, Safari, or Opera, or whatever, you see web, and then you go on the web. But you could do this seamlessly if actually the functions of the browser were immediately embedded into the OS. And to be fair, Firefox OS can be considered as the first attempt in this direction. All we need is a properly executed user interface layer on top of the internet, which is seamlessly accessed uh, from any connected device. And this way, the apps, the mobile web apps, would all finally be those web apps. And with the notion of mobile versus desktop fading away. So you don't have mobile and desktop, you just have the connected experience in what we call the Internet of Things, in a way, where the smartphone is a thing, where your tablet is a thing, or where your Fitbit could be a thing, or any, uh, anything else connected to the cloud. Yes, but to execute mobile web apps properly, you need dedication, resilience, time, and talented developers. That's the main challenge today, talent, I can tell you. To find developers who are ready to dedicate their time, their efforts, to really craft a, a beautiful mobile web app is by no means easy. But I think that helped by technological and network evolutions, we're heading in the right direction. So that's why I think that those app stores we've had now for six years uh, for the iOS app store, app store are doomed in the long run and will eventually be uh, overthrown in the post app stores era. And finally, I can just invite you to discover our modest contribution to uh, what we call the post app store zero on Etsy.me. So we have designed this mobile web app to create mobile web apps straight in the browser of your smartphone, tablet, or PC. Uh, some people have said that we would be some kind of mix between GeoCities and HyperCard and Tumblr on steroids or whatever. I mean, just, just do it and experience it and just give your own opinion. Uh, around the app maker, we have built uh, a social network also so that you can discover the apps created by, by the community. And this sets the ground for us of an ambitious platform, which will uh, actually enable us to launch a variety of services internally and with third parties. So we will create an API that will also enable third party developers to access our system and uh, add their own plugins, a bit like on WordPress, if you want, to the ads ecosystem. So at the moment, the core of uh, our platform is this mobile web app maker, but you could replace it by any kind of content generator uh, powered by the same engine. And I have one last thing to tell you. <laughs> one last thing. We have a big announcement to make today with Alex, which will be our gift to the community. So we've been working on this for uh, now 17 months. Yes, we released it. Uh, five weeks ago, we have now uh, more than 11,000 registered users. And one year from now, so if we meet again next year, we will open source Etsy and launch the Etsy SDK to allow all the front-end developers to create their own mobile web apps. But I might be wrong for the future. Never forget that it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. But I would say as a final conclusion, Believe in your vision, fight for it, and if you want to make it happen, it will happen. Thanks for your attention. So, yeah, do you have questions? Okay, I agree with everything you said. However, um, I use PhoneGap to wrap up my jQuery mobile um, um, app to up on my website okay. because I wanted to have a shortcut on my phone surface that had the icon of my app. What I got is this generic icon, but I saved my um, shortcuts to... You, you mean for Etsy at the moment? No, I'm not. Okay. I'm okay, okay. Yeah, no, okay, for jQuery. So, oh, exactly. So basically, uh, each of our apps, for instance, just to speak about us, uh, is, a, is a URL, and you can bookmark the URL to your home screen. Uh, just, I mean, Alex could tell you some details about the current state where we are, where actually those apps are running in standalone mode in such a way that at the moment, like this week, it's still our little icon which will pop up as a shortcut on your home screen. 
but in the next few days, this will be the icon of your app. So you will be able to actually have a shortcut with the icon of your app on your home screen. So it's, it's on your home screen, and uh, if you make an app about your vacation and send it to your mother, grandmother, and kids, whatever, they can bookmark it to their home screen exactly the same way. So uh, in the same way that today you can bookmark our own URL to your home screen and launch it from your home screen if you have a short memory and can't actually remember four, four letters. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so is it answering your question? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yes? Uh, I'm sorry if I, you already answered this, but uh, you'll indulge me. Uh, how do you picture this apocalypse of a applications, this app apocalypse? Um, <laughs> how do you picture that playing out on iPhone? I mean, how is that ever going to get through an Apple App Store? How, how does it work? How does it work? This is not an Apple, this is not an Apple world unless they change their policies. But I mean, technically, our, our <laughs> I mean, once again, to speak about what we, we are experiencing at the moment, uh, someone who, who just uh, wanted to access our app from the article in Cult of Mac, he clicked on the link, he opened it in his Safari, and he experienced it. So in the future, I mean, being in the App Store, is browser-based, but at the moment browser-based means, uh, let's go back to this, uh, oops, sorry. Let's go back to, where were we? Wait, oh, I'm trying to, oh, I did this. Sorry for that. Okay, let's try to get back to, up, up, up. Okay, so this, so to this one. So at the moment it opens in the browser, but as I say, I believe that in the near future actually it will open and you won't even think about the browser because it's connected to the internet, it, it just retrieves the assets from the internet and it opens, you know? And you don't need to go through all of this painful process of uh, going to the app store, tapping on the link, waiting for download. You don't need that. It's, it's, li it's like waiting for a 56 kbps connection, beep, 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 in, uh, into, in, in 1995, you know? So uh, uh, the apoc so it won't be like doomsday, you know, it won't be like Armageddon, all of a sudden the App Store explodes. Uh, I don't think that there will be an apocalypse in this sense, but I think that it just makes sense that when most of the most trafficked stuff on the App Store, like things like Airbnb or SoundCloud or YouTube, run properly in the browser on your desktop, there is no reason why it wouldn't run the same way on your mobile. There's no rational uh, metaphysical reason uh, uh, about it, you know? So that's, that's why we think that it will end big, up like that. But big technology issues, it depends what you're doing. You know, uh, f f five, uh, I, five months ago when I was pitching this thing before it was totally finished, people told me there will never be anyone on your shit. You know? And <laughs> there are now 11,000 people, we will have 50,000 in July and half a million in October based on the current uh, growth rate. So these are real people, not bots in Asia, uh, using our, uh, our application and enjoying it. So, but this guy is, a, is, is like a wizard genius. So uh, the pro, the, the, yeah, but this is, this is the difference, you know? When you pretend to build an HTML5 app, when it's just a bunch of crap, which is most of the time the case, sorry to say that, uh, but then people say it will never work. So it just, you just need a few developers who take months to do it, who have actually the time to do it, who don't have like investors pushing in their back to release something in white combinator in three months, you know? And then you can maybe hope that there will be another, another way to do things. So yeah, time and talent. Yeah? Yeah, it was, I, I guess that for people before electricity, it was hard to see that there will be bulbs in the street. Okay. You know, uh, I, I've got an app that you can see on, on our, in our community called Wrong Predictions. It starts with the electricity, which will be a fad, the television which will be a fad, and Mark Zuckerberg's telling in 2012, if I remember well, that it was the biggest mistake he's ever made. And it goes to this stand-up comedian performance when someone from his company says that actually uh, the URL is like the fundamental unit of sharing and that it misses the URL, which is kind of funny when you think about it. But uh, yeah, so 
it's crazy. I, I can tell you it's crazy. Yes, it's as crazy as saying that, uh, that uh, yes, people would have computers in their home. Do you remember that? People would have computers in their home. No, it's impossible. This is the mainframe, you know? Never, no one will use computers in their home. So, yeah. <laughs> it's Yeah, I, belie I believe, first of all, I believe that people with big boards, developers who want this to happen, will need to show to users that actually it's a better experience, you know? And that's the reason why we wanted to do this, to, to show to any dummy average Joe that actually could make something pretty sexy in five minutes in the mobile browser, running in the mobile browser. And if you can prove this to someone, if it's not like a subpar experience of some geeks, you know, uh, but something with a mainstream appeal, then maybe if there are enough of, you, of us together, uh, some investors with balls, you know, that, that can be behind us, and, and if we can have a team working on this, then maybe, uh, hopefully, I guess, uh, we can make it. But it's, it's by no means easy. I mean, for my comeback to mobile, I usually say to Alex, I should have released a farting app on the App Store. You know, it, w it was much easier to release a farting app or another uh, ephemeral shit of app on the App Store and then, and, and, and then find some VC to back it. This, this, is, this, is, this is like non-backable, you know? <laughs> if, you, if you go to VC with that, you say, are you crazy or what? Don't you see where the trend is? You're going against the current? I say, yeah, maybe, but we'll see. I've got time. <laughs> yeah? Because, I mean, of, uh, where, I don't know whether you were there at the beginning, but because, because, just because it's a better user experience. Because it's easier to build, because ultimately it's cheaper to build once, the, once everything is set, and because it's a much better user experience in terms of access, update, sharing. You know, uh, f when we had some people uh, making barbecue invitations with this and inviting their friends via text messages. Can you imagine the same use case in the App Store? The barbecue is over. There's no more meat on the barbecue before, before actually you can make the app published in the app store, you know? Or, or I don't know, any kind, I mean, you can go and see the use case. We can talk about it, but it's much, the, the user experience is just better. That's what I would say. And if the user experience is better, it makes sense. Yeah, there's more friction. I mean, we usually talk about this word friction. I showed you the example of Snapchat, four step to get the content. Uh, I think that Christian Elman earlier today, I read it on Twitter, was speaking about those uh, app store invitations, download invitations, as the new pop-up. You know, it's crazy. I mean, it's crazy, of course, that when you have a web property like Airbnb, which is pretty nice, good people go there, and then they go on the mobile, they just want to do the shit there on the mobile, and you say, go to the app store. You know, and sometimes it's stupid enough that actually your app is not available in the country where they are, whereas the web experience is available in the country where they are. Sorry? Because the web's international. Yeah, but I mean, why won't, wouldn't the App Store be international? I mean, even if Apple is based in California, you know, there's no reason why the App Store wouldn't be international, uh, technically speaking. Yeah, if you, if you, I mean, if you, if you, if you do it properly, if, you, for instance, the texts are properly uh, integrated, if, uh, if, uh, if your images are well tagged, the meta tag and all this thing, you can surface in a better way. And I remember, I mean, it's strange because we're using parcels, sorry for that, but I was last week at a, at a meetup in London and there was a guy there at Pass who was just presenting what they called dynamic companion websites for mobile native apps. So the concept is that you've got a native apps, like Secret, you know Secret? And then you want to you display the content of Secret on your web, I mean on the web, if someone wants to just access the content without downloading the app. And he was just trying to explain in an elaborate way how actually you could retrieve the content from the native app and potentially display it on the web. 
stupid. Just build a mobile web app. You know, you don't need to actually entertain two different entities to, to access the content. It's just stupid. So it's a better user experience and gain of time also to answer, uh, to answer a question. Once you know how to do it, because uh, it took 16 months to build this thing with Alex and another developer, it would have been faster as a native app today. So I decided to take this bet and to give time to Alex and the other guy to just do it. But you can speak to Alex about the details. It's by no means easy because we've got to invent. It's uncharted territory if you want. You know, there's no jQuery mobile in this thing. There's, no, there's nothing like that. Everything is encoded by Alex and by Julian. So it's, uh, it's fresh code. So you don't have any benchmark or whatever. So you, 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 need, you need to actually do it uh, on your own. But there's a reason why next year we want also to, to create a kind of SDK uh, so that all of you, I mean, the young developers also can just benefit from the work that Alex and, and Julian have done for one year. Any, any other question, maybe more technical for Alex, if you have a question? Uh, sorry? For that? But, uh, the apps, I mean, it's, things are accelerating. No, I don't think 10 years. I mean, in the next six months, we will reach 1 million users. Okay? So as far as we are concerned, it's now. <laughs> we are growing. As far as the other ones are concerned, it's up to them to jump into this or not. I mean, I cannot force other people to join us. For Apple, but I mean, where will be Apple in 10 years? You know? Will it be another Blackberry? I don't know. I mean, I'm a fan of Apple, obviously. I've got an iPhone, I've got this, but even Apple, is Apple eternal without Steve Jobs? Yes, no, I mean, we might argue. So, so uh, it, it's like, uh, you know, who would have said when everybody had a Blackberry to access their emails, I remember the early days of the iPhone, I said to one of my friends in Brussels, Okay, take an iPhone and open Gmail on your iPhone. Why oh, don't think about it? BlackBerry. BlackBerry is the email. It's secure on my phone. BlackBerry is the future. I own BlackBerry stocks. They're going like that. We'll never end. We'll never end. Sorry. So, uh, yeah. And the fun you know what the funny thing about, Blackber about BlackBerry? It's really, I mean, it's not a joke. It's not a hoax. Five days ago, a friend of mine sent me an article. The next screen of the BlackBerry, because they, they still want to make some phones, uh, will be square shaped, perfect for Atsi. Our pages are square shaped. So thank you, Blackberry, for the, the next Blackberry will be Atsi optimized, which is pretty nice. So, so yeah. Any other question to the stupid Belgian guy? No? Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Go and have lunch. <laughs>